The suspension of the Chief Justice of the Federation has continued to generate a lot of controversy in the public domain. While some have condemned it as a desecration of the judiciary, others have said it's a sign that no man is above the law. Barrister, what's your view on these issues? Well, I want to look at it from the angle of the government. I also look at it from the angle of the, the CJN. Uh, and that is the person of Onogen, who is allegedly now suspended. Now, the federal government uh, allegation against him is that uh, he failed to disclose certain amount of money that was in his bank account that he opened in 2011. Uh, when he was filing his papers in 2002, he omitted to state that those figures. Uh, but the information we gathered is when he now filed his uh, subsequent papers in 2016, when he was made the acting uh, CJN, he now disclosed those figures that he omitted in 2012. So remember that the petition was written against him this year on the 9th of January. On the 10th of January, they approached him for a response, which he did, and saying that it is correct. What they are saying is correct, but that he omitted it and it was a mistake. And that is what the government said, look, you cannot make such a mistake as a, a judicial officer, and especially occupying the position of a, a, a justice of the Supreme Court. And so they now uh, took him to uh, CCT, and that is the Code of Conduct uh, Tribunal. It was at that point that some of us got to know what is actually playing out. And then we now look at the laws and look at the provisions of the Constitution, whether what the government has done in the circumstance is correct. And a lot of lawyers are of the opinion that if you have such a, a situation where you allege a misconduct that the proper thing for the government to do in the circumstance uh, would have been to refer the serious allegation uh, you have actually uh, made a mountain of you know to the NJC it was after the NJC would have looked into the issue of misconduct uh, that they can now you know make some appropriate uh, recommendations either for trial or for suspension or for dismissal but then you can't even dismiss a CJN without the concurrence of the Senate. There are procedures for because he's not an ordinary uh, judicial officer. So it was at that point that people now went to court and said, look, the court has no jurisdiction uh, it, to uh, try this particular matter because of several plethora of cases that have ruled to the fact that if a judicial officer has committed an infraction, you have to refer the matter first and foremost to the Nat National Judicial Council after which, you know, disciplinary measures or whatever measure they will recommend they will be implemented. That they have gotten it wrong. So they challenged the jurisdiction of the uh, Code of Conduct uh, Tribunal. And that was on the 14th of January. And I understood that the man adjourned uh, the matter to 22nd of January because according to him, there are some pending applications. The primary objection that the, the council to councils to or not, Justice Onogen has filed. And then there was an application, both ex parte and on notice, uh, for the CJN to be uh, asked to step aside. And so that particular application was adjourned to 22nd. Now, on the 22nd, the same thing came up again on the issue of jurisdiction. And the court it was of the view that there were so many interlocutory orders that have been given by various courts that is not bound by it, that he will still go ahead to hear the particular matter. Then there was this issue of whether the, the CJN should uh, step aside that was made orally, and that was also countered by the councils of the CJN who said, look, we have raised the issue of jurisdiction, and we think that by procedure and processes in court, that the first thing to determine, to be determined by that, by the court, is the issue of whether the court has jurisdiction. And so with all the hula balo that took place in the court, there was no concrete decision that was actually reached as to whether the court has jurisdiction. So the matter was adjourned uh, to 28th of uh, uh, January for the court to continue for the proceedings. So on 25th, the nation was, <laughs> was uh, awoken to the news that the president of the country has suspended the CJN. And every, every person became surprised what has actually happened, on whose recommendation, on whose authority, on whose power, and then the president, in his uh, address uh, to the members of the press, or to when he was swearing in 
the acting CJN now made mention that he was acting on an order, ex parte order that was obtained on the 23rd of January 2019. And people were, what, what is going on? There was a proceeding on 22nd, and all parties have, have adequate representation. And so why would he now make an ex parte order in a matter that is purely criminal? I mean, it's a criminal trial, and of course, you have to hear the other party. That is what you call presumption of innocence. And you cannot use uh, uh, interlocutory order in order to determine the fate of an individual so what in, is a, wrong in a criminal with that? trial. Yes. What is wrong with that ex parte order? Yeah, the ex parte order means that an order that is gotten in the absence of the other party. Ex parte order is not used uh, anyhow. It is used only in extreme cases of emergency and all sense of urgency, mostly when it involves dissipation of property. Or there is an injury that will be repairable done to an individual, which if the court does not grant an order, that injury cannot be compensated monetarily. And so that's why the you know judges usually use ex parte order. But it's an order given in the absence of the other party. Remember that the issue of fair hearing is a constitutional issue. And so every party that is accused of any crime or who has a case before the court must be given a fair hearing. In order, in other words, the court must hear both sides before it comes to a conclusion. But most times, ex parte order is usually used. When not given that order, will you know involve incalculable damage that will be done to the property or the person that is coming before the court. So it is only used in extreme cases, in extreme cases, and in matters that are very urgent. Uh -huh. So you ask yourself, what is clearly urgent in this order that now directs the CJN to step aside, and then direct the president now to set up, I mean, to now swear in an acting CJN in a matter that is already before the court, in a matter where there are adequate representations, in a matter where all the parties are before the court, that what you would have done now is to argue the motion on notice, you know, unless even assume whether you can use motion on notice to even determine the rights and liabilities of individual in a matter that is a criminal trial. So it, it was something that sounds so strange to some of us who know that this cannot actually uh, be done where uh, things are done normally. That so you cannot, can, can this be considered a desecration of the judiciary? I don't want to use an extreme word, you know, to actually describe what has happened. I want to can only say that it is something that is patently wrong. It is clearly invalid, you know, based upon constitutional provisions. Because it's, it's issue of determining the rights, you know, of an individual whom you have who you want to arrange before the court, and you have gone behind now to actually determine his right in his absence. You can never shave the head of an individual behind him, you know. I mean, I mean that is the famous word of uh, Chief Abiola, Let Abiola, you know. So it is, morally, it is something wrong. Yeah. Morally, yes. Shouldn't this Chief Justice himself have yeah. recused himself before the suspension? No, I've keep on hearing this issue of recusing and resigning and all that. It means that at any point in time, somebody is accused of any crime without any proof, the person resigns. Maybe if I want to ask you to resign from an office, the best thing I would just do is to accuse you. And when I accuse you, I say, shouldn't you morally resign? I mean, there are instances where. Accusations have been against even people who are, you know, you know, in power, and we see that they have never resigned. There are so many accusations against several governors, against several ministers, and even when people say they should resign, and they have not resigned because there is no law that actually compels any public officer in Nigeria to, to, I mean, today to resign. What happens is that we, you know, it's a practice we see in developed economies, where people for even flimsy things, you know, that didn't even involve them directly. Maybe it involved their ministry or the agency because of the level of political culture that has been developed in those environments. You know what they do? They just resign. They don't want anything that will tarnish their this and that. But here, it is not yet a culture. And so when things like this happen and people say, why can't he resign? You ask, what is the issue? And that is the issue I have always you know, written you know, concerning this matter. Is the federal government actually accusing the CJN of corruption? If they have evidence of corruption against him, why don't they follow the normal process? We are not saying nobody should shoot the CJN. If the CJN is patently corrupt, then the law must take his, you know, his, his cause because he's not under immunity whatsoever. The CJN cannot in any way be corrupt and be allowed to preside over the judicial system of the country because that is actually where lives are, and destinies are determined. And you cannot allow a corrupt man to actually preside over such a very sacred institution. So if they have evidence that this man is corrupt, then follow the normal process and procedure in order to get him, you know, uh, properly prosecuted. If you are alleging this issue of omission to declare assets, then also follow the normal process to get him to be face his trial. And let me tell you about that. If it's clearly a misconduct for which you have to take him 
to the NJC because even in Gota Justice, Sylvester and Gota's case, that even came before the CCT uh, recently, this issue that the man has not been referred to NJC before being, you know, brought before the CCT came up. And as the judicial president. So yes, and the court struck out the matter and said, look, the proper thing has to be done. We're talking about justice of the Supreme Court, not even the CJ. Recently, that decision was reached. So why is this one different? Why is this issue of misconduct and not, you know, code of conduct, uh, tribunal and, and, you know, act not following the same principle that you have accused this man? Now, the allegation is that the man, you know, is, a, is, a, is the chairman of the NJC. For God's sake, when he consigns his matter, he can't preside over his matter. He has to step aside. He has to recuse himself and allow other people to decide his fate. And so why don't we test our institutions? Why won't, must we come to that conclusion that institutions cannot work? You know, because he's the one that appointed all the justices or all the members of the NJC. And so in that wise, they will not have the teremity to actually, you know, bring him to book. But we have just seen now that, that two days ago, there is this petition now that is proper now before the NJC. And the NJC has given him not even 14 days, but seven days because of the gravity of the alleged offense to respond. The that means that we must try as much as possible to test our institutions and allow laws and, and processes and procedures, you know, to be complied with or else. We find out that it is justice or not get today. It may be somebody else tomorrow. We may have somebody who is not even sent occupying the position of the prayer. And he can begin to do things as if we are in a Panera Republic. We are only trying to you know, ensure that there is compliance. We are not shielding corruption. If there is anything that makes us happy about President Buhari, is this his you know, this uh, talk about fighting corruption, he has keep on saying it at every opportunity that he's given microphone, he would keep on saying it. There are three things he has come to the government to do. One of them is fighting corruption. For ever mounting it, it makes some sense. Whether he is succeeding it or doing it the way that some of us would have loved, it's a different ballgame entirely. For ever reminding us that we must kill corruption or corruption kills Nigeria is something that is worthy of commendation. But we must also follow processes and procedure in fighting corruption so that you don't create, you don't, you know, become corrupt yourself, even in the on the verge of fighting corruption. Because anything that is not legitimate and legal is corrupt system. And we cannot use corrupt system to fight corruption. That's what we're saying. So in the light of that, if the government is fighting on the issue of non-disclosure of asset, the law itself is even very clear as to what should apply. The law says on in section three, paragraph D of this particular act, Code of Conduct Tribunal Act, that if there is a petition submitted to the conduct code of conduct bureau in respect of a public officer bordering on non-compliance or breach of the code, and you invite him, if he admits in writing of the infraction that you have mentioned to him, if he admits in writing, then the word used that it shall no longer be necessary to refer him to CCT. In other words, the law is saying there is an objective for this particular law. The objective is to make sure that whosoever is coming to public office must disclose all his full assets, what he, ha he has before assuming position. When he is also leaving that position, he must also disclose what he has acquired. Assuming that when you are coming in, you have acquired, you have up to 10 houses. And when you are leaving government, you now have up to 100 houses. Then the next issue is how did you, that cannot be tried by the CCT. That cannot be a crime under the CCT. What the CCT is all after is any infraction on this code. And part of the infraction is that if you call, if you are called, somebody has written a petition against you and say, look, I discovered that you disclose only two houses, or you have up to four or five houses in America. And you say, no, that is not true. And the government is very serious. They have done on the investigation and discovered that you have up to four or five houses and you're lying about it. Then that matter goes to CCT because that is clearly an infraction against the code. You have even lied when it is proven that you have this property. But the moment you have agreed that you own it, what they will do now is to update you and listen that you have up to seven houses. You are coming in, you have three. You are coming, you are going, you have up to added additional four. So the next issue now is whether these properties can be justified by legitimate earnings, for which now it becomes subject of corruption and investigation. And you can that can be handled either by ICPC or EFCC. It's a public officer, it can be by ICPC. Then you can be tried now in federal high court. This issue of corruption as a result of illegitimate acquisition cannot be tried by CCB. 
by CCT rather. Because the only thing that I try is when you lie under addition. And when they have confronted you with the petition and you are still lying, then those, those are, you can be tried there. But I tell you, the way the law is served is framed, I doubt whether any public officer can ever be convicted under that particular act. Because I cannot understand the reason why you have made a law and you have criminalized certain offenses. All of a sudden, you now say, provided that when that accused person is brought before the operatives of the CCB and he agrees in writing, then there is no need of referring him to CCT. In other words, you have given him a leeway. They can carefully exclude it. And when you write a petition and you bring them before the CCT operatives, and they say it's true, and that the matter ends there. But then the point is this. You may not be tried in CCT based upon this particular law, but it can be tried under other offenses when it is discovered that you cannot justify the legitimacy of those properties you have acquired. And that is, that is something we are saying that we must look at the laws properly and follow what the laws have said. No. So in this regard, it will be wrong based upon what has happened that the CJN has admitted in writing. Remember that uh, Mr., uh, the former governor of Lagos State, Mr. Tunubu, had this issue and he was never convicted under that law because the Navy even gave him the opportunity to answer to whatever he was alleged to have acquired illegally. And because of that, he was exculpated. The same thing happened to Saraki because the way that law is framed, it will be very difficult. And I say here with every sense of responsibility, it will be very difficult to convict any public officer because the law is self created offenses and also gave a room for somebody to come up and own up. So it may be difficult. Maybe you can be able to try them in order. But what we are saying concerning Onogen's case, just Onogen's case, case, is that his matter must first and foremost be dealt with by the NGC because this is not crime that he has committed outside his judicial office, like you know, office, like issue of murder, like issue of rape, of issue of uh, manslaughter, or accident on the road. This is a matter that have arisen as a result of he occupying that position as a CJN or as a judicial officer. So that matter must first and foremost be referred to NGC, which is what has been done now rightly. And they are looking into that petition because they have given me opportunity to respond. Now, his response now will determine the measures that will be taken by NGC. And that, that was saying, so the government must just do the right thing. We're not saying that we can we want to protect any person or because he's a, a CJN or because he's a judicial officer or he's a member of the judiciary. The lawyers now will gather together and begin to protect him. No, if we do that because we are lawyers of conscience, we have no moral authority tomorrow to, to, to begin to say certain things. We criticized President Jonathan then for doing certain things that was also not normal. Remember when he, sacked, he, he suspended Sanusi? We also said it was wrong. There is a constitutional provision he had to follow until we were justified by the court. The matter eventually ended up in court. Despite the fact that he, had, he removed him illegally and brought in somebody else, but the court eventually ruled that it was wrong the way he was uh, suspended. He was not in accordance with the constitution. Remember also the issue of Salami's case when it also happened. We lawyers of conscience also know something is wrong. The way this man was being treated, the way the matter was being handled was illegal and illegitimate. So we must always be above board. We must not be partisan. Lawyers must be, you know, for the country at every point in time to interpret the law correctly, not in accordance with partisanship or the political party you belong or to their religious belief or to the man you love so much. No, we must say the law the way the, way the law is. Whether the law is good or bad, we must interpret the law and then look at a way of correcting the law if the law is wrong. But for now, this is the law. Any judicial officer that is accused of infraction that arises out of his position as a judicial officer, the matter must first and foremost go to NJC. It's after that that all other processes can be exhausted, but also in accordance with the constitution. For the CJN, you cannot remove him without the concurrence of the Senate. Now, you mentioned the Justice Salami yes, issue yes. as well as the Salami issue. Yes. Is this going to eventually end up the same route? I mean, are we going to see the Justice Salami eventually being vindicated at the end of the day, perhaps by, by the judiciary? And then, issue, issue, we, issue we, of vindication. This one's full cycle. Are we yes. going to, how does this, when does this end? end. end. Well, one thing that I'm sure of is that at the end, we will find sanity, we will find clarity from the processes that have just begun. I mean, issue of the NJC now coming in. You find out that they make a pronouncement that will clearly be in tune and in tandem with the law. They will, because these are wise men. These are the best in the country occupying that position. So I don't see them going and interpreting the law wrongly. 
So that there will be sanity from that. Then secondly, there also will be sanity from the judiciary. Already there are appeals, there are cases that are pending. At the end of the day, we will know that the judiciary will also determine this issue in a manner that whoever sees it say yes. This is the way it's supposed to be because all this is happening. A lot of interpretation. Lawyers are giving different, you know, confusing the people the more. But at the end of the day, the judicial system in the country has a way of resolution of these issues. They will look at the law without looking at any person's face and say, "This is what the law is." It was resolved, even in the case involving the CJ of uh, of, of Abia State, where I come from. One day, the house just woke up without recourse to the NJC, purportedly remove a chief judge of a state. They removed him. They removed her, rather. And felt that, that they, you know, writing has been done. And the next thing they did now was an innocent man, an innocent man, one justice, Obisike Oji, who over the years had been doing, you know, has been in his career, has been rising. He was the second, you know, person in that position. The, the governor invited him and said he is the next person to be the CJ and swore him in. And swore him in. There is nothing the man did that you can consider wrong, morally speaking, because he's the second, and the governor of the state said, come in, you are now the next CJ. Now, when the matter was reported to the NJC, NJC now said, well, the woman that has been removed was illegally removed. You cannot remove a CJ of a state without recourse to NJC. I mean, they made that particular point very clear, so that any other person that wants to try such a thing Tomorrow, either the governor or the legislative assembly must know that you cannot do that without the NJC. Then now they now descended on the innocent man called Justice Obisi Koji. That why would he present himself to be made the acting CJ when he knows that he cannot in any way be a chief judge of a state without the recommendation of NJC? And because of that particular singular act, he was queried. And the next thing that came by word of punishment was for, uh, for him to be re retired. A man that have come to the position to be the chief judge of a state lost that position. That was the position that was taken by NJC. Justice Onoge was presided over that particular uh, uh, matter. And Justice Muhammad Tanko was second in command when that decision was taken. Then you now ask yourself, was Justice Muhammad right? to have presented himself to be sworn in as an acting CJN when there is no recommendation by the NJC. The NJC will look into all this matter. So as I said earlier, there will be sanity. There will be resolutions of this issue by the NJC, by the judiciary. At the end of the day, all of us will be happy. You know What the president is doing in fighting corruption, we are totally in tune with the fight against corruption. But in fighting corruption, what we're asking the president to do is that if he can get quality advice at any point in time, he's going to win this war. He get the cooperation of the judicial system. And anyone that is corrupt, let the person be kicked out of the system. But in kicking him out, follow the due process, bring all the evidence you have against that person, report that person with all that evidence to the appropriate authority. Then when they fail to act, some of us who are lawyers of conscience, some of us who love this nation, will always rise and speak out against any institution that want to condone, that want to collude, that want to connive in order to truncate this fight against corruption. Because we know what corruption has done to us as a nation. Where we are today is not where we're supposed to be. We know where the countries we started with, Malaysia, all these bigger countries, you know, smaller countries, but they have become bigger as a result of the economic growth, as a result of the fact that their resources are utilized to develop their basic infrastructures and develop the personnel, develop the human being that is in those countries and see where they are today and see where we are. We know what corruption has done. So any government that wants to fight corruption, we are totally in tune with that government. But in doing that, we only advise that please follow the due process in arriving at that. And if there is any judge that is a cog in the wheel who is corrupt, they follow the same system and get him out of And most of them are very. We get them one after the other out of the system. But the, the, the executive must follow the law. The executive also must look inwards and not condone and, con and hide corruption within the executive. Exactly. That's exactly because if we do that, that's we may exactly. not have the moral authority to begin to discipline Please. and do okay. certain things other arms of government. Yes. I, I, I really, finally, I really love to get your perspective on yes, that. Yes. It's, it's been. I, I, I alluded to the fact that this government itself mm. has been selective mm. in its fight against corruption. Mm. As a matter of fact, it has also been selective in respecting God, I mean, court order. Mm. In fact, it's quite evident that some have alleged that this government, President Muhammad's government, has 
I mean, notorious for not even respecting court order. So why is it being selective in this in this instance? We we'll, we'll really love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, uh, there are instances. Can actually. the president just be selective? In no, no, he cannot. The kind of no, laws, the president cannot. Orders that no, he no, can no, obey. He cannot. He cannot. It's, it's an independent arm of government, and whenever there is a pronouncement made by the judiciary, by the court, it binds every person. And that is what the constitution says. So you cannot select the one you will obey. I have several judgments against the Nigerian police, and up to now, they have not complied with it. And they're asking me to go and get the consent of the AG of the Federation before I execute against a government agency I have gotten judgment against. It doesn't happen anywhere in the world except in Nigeria. There are so many people that are frustrated. They have judgment against the federal government. They have judgment against agencies of government, and they, they are not being obeyed. They are not being carried out. You know, we cannot run a country that way. We must be different from others. And that's why when President Buhari was coming in, you know, and he, he really convinced me that it's going to be a country of change. I said, this is the man. And I want that particular promise that made some of us to really stay behind, to really queue behind and say, this is the man that will affect some of these changes we have been clamoring for, that we will eradicate impunity in the system, that we will eradicate a situation where anyone feels is bigger than the law. We want everyone to be subject to the law. You know, so, and I love a situation where the president will try and do that. He's doing well in terms of that fight against corruption. But at this allegation of being selective, we want a situation where everyone that is actually corrupt, he doesn't look at the faces and all that because he says, I belong to no one and I belong to everybody, which is a statement that is very fundamental and it reverberates. Anytime I read that statement, I feel that this is a way to go. And of course, when he said that statement, that was clap. What, what, what were they clapping? They were expecting a president who we consider the issue of national interest above any other interest and then begin to move a country towards the direction that we need some level of some minor detectorship at times, but in accordance with the law still, to move this country. And when a military says, don't go there, for the father he has spoken, don't go there, you know that, don't go there, if you go against it, there are consequences. We want that, but in accordance with the law. And then do it to everyone. As you are doing to the child of Mr. A, do it to the child that belongs to you. Don't go there. And let it, let it be total. You know, that's the kind of person we, you know, uh, want as a president. And he's been doing well so far, but we want a situation where it will be very holistic. This issue of selective application of laws or judgment, the one you will implement and the one you will not implement, no. If you want to run a country that is sane, you want to run a country that is under the law, that follow due process, you must apply all the laws. The ones you don't agree with, what you do, you appeal against them. Up to Supreme Court and get the final judgment. But the moment the Supreme Court has said this is the final law concerning that situation, then you have to obey it. There is no other way. Then if you don't feel comfortable with then you can amend the law by National Assembly in order to change that particular scenario that you don't agree with. That is where countries are wrong. So we can get this country going. It's a big country, beautiful nation, with all manner of things God has blessed us with going, but in getting quality men and women that will run this government, what we have discovered is that people who are at the helm of affairs, most times they don't have the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. And the moment you don't have that knowledge, you find out that you are doing things based on, 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 on whims and caprices, you know, based on sentiment and not based on quality, you know, understanding of the content of what you are doing. You know, countries are not run that way. Because you run that country that way, you run into a big problem because this country is so big. We need it to be run under a platform that everyone knows the rules and regulation and, and due process must actually be followed. Mm. Barista, thank you very much for inside. It's, 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 my, it's, my, it's my pleasure at any time.